afternoon, I thought of uh, speaking more specifically of a centering prayer, its roots and its practice and its evolution. Perhaps the best uh, place to start is, uh, is to ask the question, uh, to whom, to whom does Jesus address the wisdom saying in Matthew 6.6 6, that goes like this. If you want to pray, enter your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. These words, uh, according to the text, were a, a part of the Sermon on the Mount. We know that in other places, Jesus uh, spoke of the, of the Our Father as a way to pray. The Our Father really is, is a list of all the things that are worth praying for <laughs> the most. So it's kind of a guide to all prayer. So it, it's a marvelous summary of all prayer. But this particular advice that Jesus gives uh, must be directed towards something more specific. In, in other words, this is not a, a general list of petitions to ask for, but rather it's about an attitude of prayer. And so the word prayer here, when you want to pray, uh, really means if you want to relate to God at this deep level that Jesus is about to recommend, uh, then uh, you're the ones to whom this prayer is addressed. Uh, prayer, as you, uh, as you know, if you've been through the introductory uh, uh, program of Centering Prayer, it is always presented as relationship. That's its essence, whatever particular form or expression you make a prayer, whether ritual or, or vocal prayer or mental prayer in the sense of reflection, these, these are expressions of an attitude. So prayer is essentially your attitude rather than in the expression, though it has an expression. So what could Jesus be referring to in this case when he says, if you want to pray, enter your inner room? What he seems to mean is, if you want to move your present relationship of prayer to a new level. Later, St. Paul picks this up and, and, and says, and prays for his disciples that they might reach the deep knowledge of God. So perhaps Paul was interpreting what this passage means by prayer. It means if you want to move your present relationship with Christ to a new level, here's a little formula that might help you. Obviously, it's a general formula. Centering prayer, as well as other practices, are, are simply ways of concretizing or making a little more detailed and hence more accessible this overall program of what Jesus called entering the inner room, closing the door, and praying in secret. So centering prayer, then, is a way of progressing towards that final point in which Jesus says, pray in secret. What that is will be the subject of this discourse. First of all, just to remind you uh, of prayer as relationship means that whenever you start to relate to God in any way, at any age, at any time, you, you have to start where you are. And this may be a rather pedestrian, to say the least. Or an in, a, a child prays, the famous prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, and so on. Well, well God being love itself adjusts God's self to wherever we're at. So, so the prayer of the child is just as delightful to him as, as any other 
uh, or the maturest kind of prayer. But it, it's, it's meant to evolve like any relationship evolves. Think of your own friends, how your relationship started out maybe a little awkwardly. And then as you hung out together, it became a little more relaxed and you, get, you began to disclose your, your feelings more readily and your ideas and aspirations. And so as the level of trust grows, the level of self-disclosure grows, and the acceptance of the other person of your uh, foibles and your aspirations and your family and all the things that relate to you uh, moves the, the awkwardness uh, of, of beginning relationship uh, to friendliness, that is to say, and at easeness with the other person so you enjoy their company and you like to share with them, call them on the phone and and uh, unload all your uh, annoyances onto, into their willing ears. And you have a shoulder to cry on. At so so it's, it's, it's a greater kind of relationship. Well, at some point in that relationship, there comes a realization that this friendliness is moving towards a, a, a commitment to each other uh, that is quasi-permanent. And this is what normally is meant by friendship. A friendship, as distinguished from acquaintanceship, involves a commitment. And, and the commitment is the doorway, then, to all kinds of levels of, of further commitment, union, and unity. Some friendships evolve into marriage, some into uh, spiritual friendship or soul friendly. And, uh, and, and so what Jesus is, is addressing in this wisdom saying, it seems to me, are people who have uh, passed through a certain acquaintanceship to friendliness and are now, through this invitation, being called to the deep knowledge of God or friendship, a commitment. And what expresses that commitment in the concrete is, is your determination to practice contemplative prayer or this passage to it that we call centering prayer on a regular basis. In other words, it's almost like living together. Now, I, if you heard this morning's talk, I don't consider living together until you're spending all the time in the presence of God. Jesus is much more considerate. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's only asking here for basically a regular intervals of uh, dates. Call it a heavy date. <laughs> At least it's an encounter that you don't lightly avoid or, or lose. And this is how friendship develops, where you uh, show up to your appointments. Otherwise, the other person will begin to lose interest. So, so God never loses interest, but if he sees that we're a little haphazard in showing up for our agreed-upon interviews, uh, he said, well, okay, I'm not going anywhere, but if you're not ready for this friendship, come back in 10 years, I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> I'm not going away. But you'll be losing all this time in which you could have been developing these incredible levels of friendship, union, and perhaps unity. So, so this wisdom saying then is, is an is a, is a invitation on top of the general invitation. It's, it's a kind of invitation that might be described, if you want to look at it this way, as a betrothal. It's a kind of engagement. And so if you accept this engagement, then all of the graces of your baptism, which is a symbolic engagement, begin to come into focus and you begin to understand what you got into with baptism. Namely, it's a, it's a commitment 
of engagement leading to spiritual marriage. That's what it's for. It's a symbol of your acceptance of the death of the false self, symbolized by the immersion in baptism, the water, the washing, and rising out of the water and the baptismal white garment and the candle, all symbols of inner resurrection in union with Christ. Which, so baptism foresees, anticipates, and inspires us to pursue the call or invitation to not just friendship with God, but to the particular kind of friendship that is spiritual marriage, or another word for this, is transformation in Christ. So it's a marvelous invitation. Again, it's, an, it's not imposed on you. It's not something you should do. It's something you, you may want to do. It's your choice. And, and so Jesus says, if you want to pray, it's up to you. If you want the deep knowledge of God, here is a practical way of proceeding. It doesn't, of course, uh, put out of business all our other prayers, or our ritual, or our sacraments, or our commun communal uh, worship, or our works of mercy, and our good deeds, and all the rest of it. It simply moves, it in, moves uh, or introduces a further dimension of friendship and intimacy, which, if you pursue it, will infuse into all the other practices of everyday life. A new perspective will help you to understand the purpose of all these other practices. They're all going in the same direction, ways of cultivating the contemplative dimension of your being, the contemplative dimension of the gospel, and to bring these together and to connect them in a relationship of ever-deepening love and mutual understanding. And, as I said this morning, if you understood it properly, a movement of equality. To be perfect, love is between equals. Therefore, in some way, God has to make us equal to God's self. Now, this is not uh, numerical equality, but it, it, it supposes that God gives us the love that psychologically or spiritually enables us to feel that we're giving to God as much as we're receiving. That's the term of transformation when it reaches its perfection. So. You can see from this kind of doctrine that, that most of us are way out of whack <laughs> as far as understanding our relationship to God or the incredible uh, initiative that God has or the desire that God has to communicate to us the absolute maximum of divine light, life, and love that we can possibly receive. That's God's plan. How can this be? Don't ask me. I'm only telling you the way it is. That's God's invention, not ours. In any case, uh, with this background, we're ready to hear what this formula might be that would move our relationship, wherever it is now, to a more profound level. It has to be a sufficient amount of time that we hang out with God, so to speak. And, and although we're always with God, we think we're not. So it's this habit of thinking we're not with God that has to be overcome. And since that's deeply, deep-seated, it, it takes a little time and work to unravel those misconceived ideas or belief systems. So the first step, then, in Jesus' recommendation is to enter the inner room. Where is this? It has nothing to do with the geographical location, because in Jesus' time, uh, 
society was very stratified, and everybody was either very well-to-do or very poor, and there was no upward mobility. So the poor, who was most of the people Jesus was speaking to, didn't have one room sometimes, let alone a private room. So he couldn't possibly have been referring to a, a mansion that had several rooms, including a private one, to which you could retire for, for prayer. It rather refers, as it was understood by the monastic fathers and mothers of the desert, and by the fathers of the church in their uh, interpretations of this passage, it, it rather refers to the spiritual level of our being, the, 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 the level of intuition and the spiritual will, which, which are uh, levels of our uh, being that we're not normally in touch with unless we initiate the spiritual journey or have had some mystical experience that awakens us to this dimension. For instance, nowadays there seem to be a lot of people who have what is called a near-death experience, or short of that, an out-of-body experience. Don't go away. <laughs> I'm not talking these up. I don't recommend them, but if it happens, it, it, it provides us with a certain useful data about the human situation that is intriguing. Uh, there are literally thousands of cases now carefully documented in which people were thought to be dead and, and died biologically on the table or even declared brain dead, and they came back after having experienced this passage or flight outside their bodies, which took them, they say, normally through a tunnel towards a bright light, and some negotiated the full length of the tunnel and others did not. But in any case, they got to the other end and found it absolutely delightful. All, almost no one wanted to come back. They liked it. And there they felt welcomed by some figure that was meaningful to them, sometimes relatives, sometimes Jesus, sometimes a marvelous light. But inwardly, uh, they perceived that, it, that that it was not time for them to die and that they were literally sent back to the body. And sure enough, they came back to the astonishment of the doctor. Not long ago, there was someone at, at one of our intensive retreats at Snowmass. And, and in, a ch in the checkout, she was sharing her, this, her own. She had an out-of-body experience after she had a terrible um, auto accident which her car was totaled, and she was dragged to the hospital, and, and, and she was put on the operating table, and she heard the doctor saying, we're losing her, we're losing her. And the next thing she knew, she was off flying into this tunnel, and, and she came into the presence of God, she said. And there he welcomed her, but he said, uh, you have children to take care of, I want you to go back, and so on. So she returned. Well, on the way back, here's an intriguing detail, she, she flew in spirit over, over the used car lot where her old car was sitting <laughs> that had been all utterly destroyed. It was just sitting there. And then she returned to the body. But she said to us, I, I live in longing to go back there. I, I have no desire to stay in this life. I have no fear of death whatsoever, and I can't wait to get back home. What uh, uh, this practice is obviously doing, or at least in Jesus' intention, is, is to get us more, feel more at home with the presence of God and God's closeness and in various forms of reassurance, short of a near-death experience of that kind. What, what Jesus is, is recommending uh, here, basically, is, is the freedom or the unraveling of the habitual way of thinking about ourselves 
and about reality, which is basically uh, our unquestioning acceptance of the, of the uh, cultural conditioning that we've been through in our particular part of the world or wherever, wherever you were brought up. And, and so the way to get over excessive cultural conditioning and to open the mind, you notice uh, our fundamental book, Open Mind, Open Heart, is about openness. It's the first step in, in, the, in the development of, of, of wisdom. It's the openness that our ideas may not be correct. Openness to the fact that we don't know everything. Openness to the fact that we need to uh, learn from all the sources of knowledge that God has provided for us, such as, such as science and nature, when these are, are verifiable. So the, the inner room, then, is, is the spiritual level of our being that we enter by leaving behind our ordinary psychological awareness. That's why we suggest closing the eyes as a symbol of letting go of our immediate surroundings but it's also a symbol of letting go of all the material uh, stimulations of our senses, uh, our memory, our, our uh, plans for the future, our images and our talents, and all the things that we tend to over-identify with in daily life in order to have the openness to turn towards the spiritual level of our being, and beyond that, to what might be called the true self, as opposed to the false self, the one that we think we are, and to the inmost center of our being where uh, God is present. And that is called the divine indwelling. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are living in us as the creative force of our being, and also as the redeeming or healing presence uh, that is aimed at, at, at healing the wounds of a lifetime of an emotional character and, and activating all of the gifts that were given to us in baptism. So besides the, the uh, unconscious material that we repressed in early childhood because it was too painful to face. There is also what has been discovered and called uh, the collective unconscious, which is the influence of cultural conditioning for centuries upon centuries that uh, tend to form us in, in a certain predispositions towards reality and, and, and which give us belief systems by which we judge whether certain things are good for us and certain things are not good for us, as well as the societal values that have been very destructive in the course of history, such as uh, serfdom or such as slavery, such as forced marriages, uh, such as uh, political uh, domination, dictatorships, power struggles, wars, all of these things that, uh, that have a certain honor or, or at least uh, excuse in our culture, uh, we can look at in a different way and decide for ourselves whether th these are true values or false values or whether they harmonize with the teaching of Jesus and our commitments as, as a Christian. So by stopping our ordinary thoughts temporarily on a regular basis, you have an opportunity to uh, expose oneself to other ways of looking at things, and above all, to the presence of God and its values. In other words, uh, stopping our thoughts and entering the inner room and exposing ourselves to the values of the gospel and the divine presence is going to change us substantially. Now, if you don't want to change, there's no use staying here. You might as well ask for your money back and leave now. 
because that's what this. Everyone wants to be transformed, but almost no one is willing to be changed. <laughs> so if God had figured out a way of providing transformation without change, you'd have a lot more followers. <laughs> As it is, the only way you can be transformed is, is to change the way we are now. That is to say, the emotional investment in belief systems and in ways of finding happiness that we've habitually believed were certain all the way through. So, so the spiritual journey or the work of the inner room is to undermine some of our uh, naive certitudes. Hence, it, this is an education in reality. Or to put it another way, contemplative prayer is an education in unearned love. It's not our, our religious belief systems that are the problem unless they're distorted. It's rather the, the naive unquestioning acceptance of the popular beliefs in our culture. And, 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 and here we are in the West, the, uh, most people are not questioning. Uh, our materialistic culture, our consumerism, our uh, uh, patriotic uh, excesses, our economic domination over the rest of the world, or our globalization attitudes in which uh, the economy is the most important uh, factor. It can't be. People are the most important factor on Earth. And hence, a, a lot of our ideas uh, that are uh, formed by the culture that we've grown up in, it takes a long time to unwind them and to give ourselves a chance even to reevaluate them. Maybe they're not all wrong, but maybe we need to make them our own or adjust them in some degree. So, so that's why you have to enter the inner room, a symbol of letting go of your assertitudes about beliefs that are simply popular and have next to nothing to do with the gospel, which are true values. And so, uh, Jesus is saying that, that these attitudes are so deeply ingrained in us that just in a, a Sunday visit, or maybe uh, even once a day for a short reminder of God's presence, is not enough to address the roots of our problem. In other words, we, we need to cultivate this friendship with Christ to an adequate degree to feel comfortable in reevaluating our value system and in letting go of things that we thought would bring us happiness, but which we now perceive are opposed to the gospel and therefore are actually the source of, of our discomfort with gospel values and, and which foul up our relationships with other people. So that first step then of closing our eyes is to let go of everything that supports our idealized image of ourselves and our society in order just to be with God and to receive his ideas. It's like friends. Uh, you, you, if you're very outgoing and talk talking, I uh, love to talk and hear yourself talk, then it may be some weeks before the other person finally says, well, how about you're listening to what I have to say now? <laughs> and this may come as a shock, because often we're not aware of talking all the time. And so it is with God. He listens, he listens, listens to all this stuff, goes on and on and on. And, and, and so he, now he invites us into the room, and, and the, the only request he has is, be still. Be still, and, and that gives God a chance for you to know him. And he's quite different from what you think. But the point is, if you only do that once a week, in the next 
course of the next few days, you forget. And the old habits return, and your old convictions return, and your reactions when those expectations are frustrated continue. So you're back in the old vicious circle of desire, frustration, more desire, more frustration, and so on. So that's the first step. Closing your eyes, half the world disappears. But when you're doing this together, as, as we will be one a little later this afternoon, you're, you're not leaving each other. That's not the point. You're not withdrawing from the human base. On the contrary, you're joining each other at the deepest level and affirming each other's basic goodness and true selves and opening as a group to the divine presence within. And hence, it, in a sense, it's a more powerful experience for many people than doing it alone, although circumstances require us to do it alone since we can't get this group of people together that often. But it's a, it's a nice occasion when you have a large group of people doing it at the same time together. But normally we have to work this out uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And the next step then, once one has deliberately let go of one's ordinary psychological awareness and the stimuli that keeps it going. Now you have to confront the interior dialogue. And this seems to be what is addressed in Jesus' uh, next phrase, close the door. Of course, uh, close the door might be a hint uh, not to interrupt a prayer until it's over. So closing the door is a help to stay inside. Some translations even say, bolt the door. <laughs> Though that's for difficult characters. <laughs> but if you're of good faith and good intention, then closing the door means letting go of the interior dialogue or the noise of our incessant commentaries on what is happening in daily life and our emotional reactions to them. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deeper level of being still. Now notice the cascading effect towards silence, leaving behind the external noise and tumult of the moment, then leaving behind the interior noise and tumult of our, of our chatter within ourselves and our commentaries on everything. Now we're in the inner room with the door closed. We're ready to go. And now Jesus says, pray to your father, Abba. Now we see why Jesus emphasized who Abba is. He's not just any old father. He's most loving parents, so there's nothing to be afraid of, and, and hence we're not the least bit afraid to make ourselves totally vulnerable to this presence. And, and that's the attitude of secrecy. But to be totally in, vulnerable involves a further letting go than the external or the interior dialogue we just spoke of. And that is called Pray in secret. This is the term of the whole process. This is the goal, so to speak, if you can call it a goal, of centering prayer. It's to be zero. It's to be nothing. It's to be nowhere. It's simply to be in the presence of God. And here's what the secrecy seems to mean. Letting go of any self-reflection including the awareness that you're praying, including any expectation or goal in sitting in the inner room, such as having no thoughts or having uh, uh, peace or having a spiritual experience. Any expectation at all is not being still and is an expression of the ego. So the ego, that is self-reflection, or the separate self-sense, is the ultimate silence. Since it's so difficult 
to unwind that habitual way of thinking of ourselves, you won't achieve this state except momentarily, usually for some years, because you have to keep doing it again and again and learning from experience that there's no payoff whatever in thinking about this prayer. The way you can tell its fruit is not during the prayer, but after it's over, if in daily life you feel more peace, contentment, and so on. But any, any flashy experience is really detrimental in the prayer. Obviously, if you have inspirations, you have to have inspirations. But as soon as they pass, again you return to being still. Charismatic folks had a little difficulty with this instruction. <laughs> and, and I don't blame them, because they said, uh, are you saying that if I have a, what I consider an inspiration of the Holy Spirit to pray for some intention or for some person during centering prayer, that I should disregard the movement of the Spirit? which I reply, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> the reason is an inspiration to pray for some particular subject is a good inspiration, but it's not as good as the inspiration to be still and totally silent. Because if you ever succeed in establishing that inspiration as a, an abiding attitude, then you're praying for everybody or every good intention and all humanity all the time, especially during the prayer. So during the prayer, you don't have to pray for particular intentions. Even if you feel inspired by the Spirit, there might be some great exception if somebody announces they're dropping an atomic bomb on you, you might take time out to <laughs> pray, pray for help. But apart from the most extraordinary circumstances, the best thing to pray for, as Jesus himself suggested in the Gospel, is for the Holy Spirit himself, not just for inspirations from the Holy Spirit, but the person of love itself. As I said this morning, our destiny is to become love, the love of God. And so when you're praying in Centering Prayer, you're praying in the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is praying in you without your knowing for what. But you can be sure that you're praying for everything that is God's will from the beginning of eternity to the end. Time is no more, space is, second, is of no consequence. It's your intention to consent to God's presence and action now, in this moment, that allows the Spirit to pray in you for the intentions of the Spirit, which is that God's will may be done from the beginning to the end of the human race. And beyond, who knows what God has in store beyond that. So you're praying for everything that is good. You're also praying in union with Christ. Because the centering prayer is a participation. Remember, it's a a concrete expression of your baptismal commitment, your engagement with Christ, which involves the death of the false self and the inner resurrection of the true self, along with all of the graces and benefits that are inherent in that uh, inner resurrection process that I'll, I'll speak about in a moment. So. To pray in secret, then, is to pray in secret from yourself. No self-reflection. Hence, such commentaries as, I did better yesterday. <laughs> Why did I ever start this process? Will the time ever end? <laughs> Would someone please tell the Trappist to stay home and not bother or <laughs> people with these. Where are those thoughts coming from? Right out of the ego and right out of the uh, 
interior dialogue that we had agreed to drop when we closed the door intentionally. But you see, uh, the, our feelings and thoughts pay no attention to our intention. They just laugh. <laughs> so we're not going to have any thoughts. <laughs> just try it, they say. And then, then we get frustrated. But when you get frustrated, what is that? It's just another thought. And so if you've learned the guidelines thoroughly, you do with that what you do with all any perception at all. Remember, thoughts in the centering prayer is, is, are feelings, vis, uh, images, concepts, plans, past, future, sensations outside, sensations inside. The agreement is you enter the inner room, you leave every stimulation of knowledge outside to open to the intuitive presence of God and to the divine presence itself, which is beyond any experience. It's, it's awesome, this invitation. Here you are alone with the alone. But the alone is home and, and uh, loves you and you couldn't be in a safer place. It's just that you have to keep going back there to establish new habits of thought and relating to reality over and against the habitual ones that we've been following for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 years. by returning again and again for a reasonable period of time, we suggest 20 minutes to a half an hour, twice a day, you're slowly rolling back the misguided development of the false self over the whole of your life. Now, what goes on in the inner room? This is fascinating stuff. We're not just exposing ourselves to the divine presence. We do that by consenting, and, and we choose, as you know, a sacred symbol to support our consent when the inevitable thoughts come down the stream of consciousness that stimulate our programs for happiness or our over-identification with our group. Both of these are the two cornerstones of the false self system. So, so we're... So in the, in the secrecy of the prayer, uh, when we're not thinking about ourselves, or when we do, we return ever so gently to the sacred symbol of usually a word that we've chosen, <clears throat> you, you may be bombarded with thoughts on the psychological level, but through your intention, you've moved to the spiritual level of your being so no thoughts can hurt you unless you follow them. So you can have the wildest thoughts on earth, or the most murderous, if you prefer. They have no effect on diminishing the prayer unless you pursue them, unless you follow them. Intention is very powerful stuff. It's not understood how powerful it is, but let me give you just two examples. Those of you who are married, there was a, some point in the ceremony when somebody asked you if you would declare your intention to marry this guy, and you said, I do. Immediately, your whole life changed forever. <laughs> I consider that a significant effect. Or, to put it differently, in the exercise of the sacraments, what, what confects the Eucharist? When the duly ordained person says, this is my body, he simply has the intention of, of, of making the Eucharist. And that makes it happen, at least in our faith. It's not a big deal. There's no musculature involved here. There's a simple interior intention that affects this extraordinary result. Well, with all proportion guarded, when you make the intention to be at the spiritual level of your being, that's where you are. There's no obstacle. 
we are where our will is, and the intention is the expression of our will, the spiritual will, to be more exact. So when you sit down, you're manifesting that will, and you're actually sitting down with Christ on the cross, participating in the Paschal mystery, so that the joys and sorrows and the purification and the are not just your sufferings in the process of healing the wounds of a lifetime, but are part of the redeeming work of Christ, which is redeeming you, but also everybody else in the human family, so that your, your participation is not just a privatized journey to perfection or wholeness, but is contributing to the healing of the whole human family in direct proportion to the intensity or purity of your union with God. It's that that is the source of mission or apostolate. Remember, in, in the case of Mary Magdalene after Jesus' resurrection, uh, it was he, it was she rather, whom he sent to the apostles to announce the resurrection. So the apostles were not advanced enough in love to be able to, to, to uh, uh, present this information. It was Mary who was deeply, more deeply advanced in love that became thereby a apostle in her very being. So, so this is what is happening in Centering Prayer. You're becoming an apostle or, of Christ in your very being so that whatever you do, whether you even mention the name of Christ out loud, is, is, is healing and transforming the, the, the emotional wounds of the world, beginning, of course, with our own. Okay, if we could be still long enough, you'd be transformed very quickly. It's not going to happen in a hurry. Even if you have great experiences of ecstasies, it doesn't change the permanent setup of our character. It's only over time that grace gradually unwinds the habits of a lifetime so that the presence of God becomes second nature. It doesn't go away. You can't hang on to it. You can only open your mind and heart to it and wait for it to take root. Meanwhile, both you and God have to put up with the habitual <laughs> nonsense that goes on in our heads most of the time. Now we're dealing, we, we have ourselves in the inner room. We've closed the door. We've got 20 minutes to a half an hour just to be still. And we're being bombarded with thoughts or, or uh, stimulation to think about this or that. And as long as there's any attachment in your conscious or unconscious life, then every now and then a thought is going to catch you because the roots of your attraction are still there. So it's, it's, it's a t letting go of the roots of our attachments that is the key to the healing of the wounds of a lifetime. And, and that can be reinforced in everyday life by recognizing, with God's help, what your predominant attractions are in the way of finding happiness through the instinctual needs of security, approval, or power and control. When you have no longer any desire to control anything, you, you would probably be in divine union. There is no other obstacle. Or, when you let go of your exaggerated desire for approval or affection and esteem, you're free. And, and there's, there's no obstacle except these attachments. And, uh, but the more subtle attachments, obviously, take longer and they require a more intensive treatment. You know, like some illnesses require more intense antibiotics. Right? or certain mental difficulties require a, a deeper kind of psychotherapy. Well, the divine psychotherapy goes deeper than any therapy. 
much more thorough. And God knows us perfectly inside and out and still loves us. And so he, he, here's where divine love is not sentimental. It relentlessly pursues everything in us that is selfish because we can't have the freedom to enter the fullness of the kingdom to which he compared the eye of the needle as a passageway. With that baggage, any possessive attitude is wealth in the perspective of the kingdom of God. So whether you have a billion dollars or ten dollars, if you are depending on this, instead of God, you can't get through the eye of this needle. In fact, you notice here the gentle kind of humor that Jesus had. He doesn't usually tell jokes. Um, but, uh, jokes are basically a rather second day, secondary way of manifesting humor. The best kind of humor is spontaneous, which sees the, uh, the amusement uh, the, the, and strangeness in human foibles and, and is not judgmental, but just enjoys the ridiculous way that people act, <laughs> beginning with ourselves. And so, so uh, you see this humor in Jesus from time to time. And I think this, par imagine a camel getting through a needle. I mean, it's ridiculous. So he was, remember he was talking to his disciples who were horrified with the idea that it would be hard for a rich person to get into the kingdom. And Jesus only emphasizes how hard it would be by saying it would be easier for a camel to get through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into the kingdom. Well, it sounds a little harsh at first sight, and it sounded like the end of the world to the disciples who were still in business, after all, <laughs> and, and, and had by no means given up the idea of, of the value of the bottom line. But anyway, <laughs> Jesus is implying if you want to get through the eye of a needle, the best transportation is not a camel. Obvious, but it, it draws a certain smile in thinking of how ridiculous people are in thinking that that would succeed. It won't. And, but what is a rich person, in Jesus' view, is not how much money you have in the bank, but how attached you are to whatever you have in the bank or don't even have in the bank, but still desire. So to let go of your dependence on the values that the culture represents as fulfilling your need to find happiness in the gratification of, instinct, of the instinctual needs of security, approval, and power, this is the root of I would dare say at least half of all of our emotional problems and our relationships. Without letting go of the exaggerations of those desires to find happiness there in those things, then uh, our relationships with God can get mixed up and you can have a codependent relationship with God a dysfunctional relationship with God, to use psychological terms. In other words, we find ourselves trying to manipulate God. <laughs> Give me this. How dare you take away these conscious consolations in prayer? Do you think I'm going to continue to pray? Think again. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, how people regard God if it was, uh, you wouldn't treat a dog the way some of us treat, uh, at least not your favorite dog. In any case, uh, this work of the inner room uh, has two main thrusts. And the first one is the affirmation of our basic goodness. We're the, all made in the image of God, so we're basically very good. And, and this goodness can never be lost, no matter what happens or whatever 
horrors you may commit, the basic goodness that God gave to us in creating us in the first place can never be lost and remains, uh, theologians tell us, even in hell. But here again is where the belief systems of our culture affect us. For all practical purposes, a lot of people in our culture especially have a low self-image. They were oppressed, rejected, their desires for happiness in the form of instinctual gratifications was withheld deliberately or not deliberately. They, they repress the pain into the unconscious where the energy continues. The body becomes a warehouse for this negative energy and hence interferes subtly with our decisions in life and our attitudes towards other people. Now, this is how the false self develops. And from four to eight, it's complexified by the social period in which we absorb the values of our parents, education, peer group, I suppose, the values on television and the internet. All of these things uh, are, are impressed or imposed on a child's mind because it doesn't have the resources of reason yet to evaluate them. So, so the child helplessly or unquestionably absorbs these belief systems as the truth because there's no alternative. And, and so this is, this is the radical problem of the unconscious. It, the discovery of the unconscious 100 and 150 years ago, one of the greatest contributions to the spiritual journey uh, of all time, I would say, because it, it, although it was intuited by the great mystics, modern psychology has given us a very clear and detailed diagnosis of, of how this thing works and the damage it does to our relationships. So if you have this enormous desire for control that it hasn't been uh, satisfied at all, but constantly frustrated, then one doesn't want to face the pain of remembering it. And so it's as if one didn't have this desire for control. It's hidden from us. And, 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 and we glorify it by various names, saying this is prestige or manliness or feminineness or whatever is, is the mystifying intent. But meanwhile, the energy itself merrily goes on, fouling up our relationships. And we're not even aware of the problems that we're creating for other people, because it seems like second nature to us and that everybody it should be obvious to everybody that they should do what we say. How can they doubt it? Isn't it obvious <laughs> that we're in? And it doesn't occur to us there's something off or something a little strange about this position. But it could also be the need for approval, or it could be the demand for security. And here's where security needs are especially subtle, because the greatest security is usually given to us uh, through our religious commitment. Now, there's nothing wrong with religion, and, and we have uh, certainly, this is the normal way to develop our relationship with God. But we bring to our religious attitudes these unconscious motives of control, approval, but especially security. So sometimes we defend our religion not because we really believe, it, it's the truth, which it may be. But our real motive is hidden from us. It's because we want to find in our particular observance the ultimate security. If I practice my religion, then everybody else is wrong, and I can peacefully despise them. <laughs> and, and God has to reward me now by putting me in heaven because I accept all the tenets of this particular religion. Baloney. <laughs> this is not true religion at all. It's simply a, a, a desire to find gratification in something that appeals to our or strengthens our need of security in the form of certitude in our religion. And hence, it interferes with our respect and understanding 
of other people's religions. And ultimately, it has led to the kind of violence that has made religion the absolute bane of the universe for centuries. And it's still going on. Religious convictions that lead to war is not religion. Even the Pope has said this. No violence is justified from the perspective for a religious motive. Maybe defense under certain circumstances, but nothing else. And in a world where defense might involve nuclear weapons which would destroy everybody, I would think there's serious doubt about whether you can defend yourself even if it's pretty sure that these weapons will be involved. So, so here we are at the very edge of utter catastrophe in this world right now. And, and all the more reason why those who are doing Centering Prayer, uh, their contribution is enormous, because who knows what to do in the concrete? But you could pray, and the power of prayer coming from individuals who are becoming more in love with God, or at least uh, purified of the false self, is going to pour mysterious but very real positive energy into the world that may lead uh, to a greater possibility of, of peace. In any case, uh, the inner room then is the place where the Holy Spirit, or Jesus as the divine therapist, gradually reveals to us the contents of our unconscious, the undigested emotional wounds of a lifetime, which come to our awareness sometimes during the prayer in the form of, of primitive emotions, raw emotions like grief, anger, depression. But they have no relationship to the immediate past. And that's the sign that they're actually coming as a healing process from our psychological tummy, so to speak, that has never digested the original pain of the trauma that took place either in one incident or in a series of incidents that became habitual. All those who have suffered oppression over an extended period of time have, have great pain of this kind. Most of it is unconscious to them. But it's not surprising, then, that this pain sometimes erupts from the unconscious into extreme activity that we interpret as crime, but perhaps God interprets it quite differently as simply a sign of the depth of the woundedness of this person. So the, the way to solve this problem is not to build more prisons, I, can, I assure you. Where, who's going there? your grandchildren at this rate, because there's so many of them, and so numerous, and they even privatize them now, so that it, it's a way to make money, stick people in jail and keep them there as long as possible. The, the whole system is very sick and in need of, of profound reorganization. And instead of rehabilitation, apart from some efforts in the federal prison, you, people are just being warehoused as useless bodies in so many state and county jails that uh, the, uh, they're only making people worse. It's an appalling destruction of human potentiality uh, to stow people away there and think they're going to not cause any harm. They'll just be worse when they come out unless the real efforts at rehabilitation well, here is where, uh, if we could persuade people early in life to be aware of the dynamics of how the false self grows, perhaps some of the problems could be addressed early enough in their lives before they develop uh, kind of reactions that f force uh, the, uh, some kind of restraining action. For ourselves, this. There, besides this, this healing of the negative energies that we've absorbed and which are largely hidden from us, and, uh, and the purification of the unconscious, there is uh, uh, 
this other work of, uh, that is involved with the affirmation of our basic goodness and consists in the releasing of the enormous gifts that God has given us in baptism and perhaps or whenever we attain to, to the life of grace. And these are, first of all, the, the, the divine indwelling, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwelling within us, and then the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, the moral virtues that are infused, fortitude, temperance, uh, prudence, and justice. And then the fruits of the Spirit described in Paul, uh, Galatians 5, which are charity, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, patience, self-control, goodness, and several others. And then uh, the Beatitudes, which are even more profound exercises of virtue and, and manifestations of Christ's risen presence within us. In other words, they are the signs as they're released from what might be called the ontological unconscious. The unconscious that is uh, uh, similar in the sense that it's unconscious to us, but is also just as present, but totally positive uh, as a counterpart to the psychological unconscious where the repressed material of a lifetime needs to be brought to consciousness in order to release it. It doesn't require most of the time anything more than feeling it and it's gone. It's just energy, but when it's repressed, it interferes with the free flow of our positive energy. Well, here's, here then is what is happening in the inner room. As, as we open ourselves, mind and heart, to the divine presence, we begin to release those gifts that, uh, that as kind of our endowment as a result of baptism. And it's like a trousseau, you might say, in which the prospective bride is, is given a suitable ornaments and furnishings and other things that prepares... Uh, in olden times, prepared someone to be a respectable bride in a fairly, at a fairly fancy wedding. In other words, God has called us to the spiritual marriage, but he doesn't expect us to walk in naked. <laughs> that would not be appropriate. He gives us so many gifts that we're able, as these are activated through the regular period of centering prayer, you begin to experience the divine life within you. You begin to uh, uh, express spontaneously the kind of selfless love, the kind of joy in everyday life, the kind of peace that surpasses all understanding, a certain gentleness, uh, meekness, which is no energy for anger, goodness, which is the capacity to see God in nature and in other people and in events, in other words, all of these wonderful gifts begin to be activated as you hang out in this inner room without any effort uh, of your own, especially, except to accept the dark side of your personality as the divine therapist shows this to us, not to trip us up, but because you've got to recognize this stuff and own it in order to work through it and get rid of it. it most of it can be gotten rid of without a lot of psychotherapy, but some things are so complex or hindrance that therapy can help. So we sh don't be afraid to use enlightened therapy to further the work of the inner freedom if, if, if you have something that's a special problem, like rejection, like abuse of some kind or other. This normally benefits from the help of an expert, which reinforces then the healing effort of the divine action and vice versa. So in the inner room, therefore, God is doing these two things, affirming our basic goodness, releasing these extraordinary gifts that are freely given in baptism or whenever you reach grace, or perhaps with birth, I don't really know. It's also unloading 
the emotional baggage of a lifetime that was hidden in the unconscious. Hence, every time you go into this room, you're, you're experiencing the movement of inner freedom, of, of, of a certain uh, sense of peace, of joy, of coming home, of relationship with God. And you're finding what true happiness actually is even if it's only a little taste. But that taste draws you on to move even deeper beyond the spiritual level of the being into your true self, into union, the spiritual marriage, and into unity, where the divine love becomes who you are. And basically, that is who we are. We just can't believe it or think it can't be true. It is true. And and, and so this uh, movement into silence is, or stillness, as I described it, a cascading movement into peace and quiet and even letting go of self-reflection. Uh, this then initiates and supports the whole healing process, which is the redemption of our being, body, soul, and spirit, and, and our concern, because being is concern for everything that is. So as we participate in God's being, your, your relationship with others will improve spontaneously, and, and our sense of stewardship for the earth and the universe increases. We ex experience then a belonging to creation, and belonging to God, and belonging to each other willing to, uh, to share, as Jesus did, the sufferings of the world in order to further everybody else's transformation. And perhaps at this a moment in history, uh, one quote I'd like to leave you with, and that is uh, the Holy Father, uh, Pope John Paul II, in his millennium letter about just before the year 2000, said the three things that need to be emphasized in the next century or millennium, in his view, and these were, or, or, or practices for, that would be most appropriate for our time. And, and he said one was the liturgy of the hours, by which he means vespers and lauds, which are mostly the Psalms in which you sort of put one in contact with the liturgy of the Roman Catholic Church, the prayer of the church as a whole. But the other two are especially interesting. The second one is Lexio Divina, and the third one is contemplative prayer. So I venture to say that if you're doing centering prayer, you're in complete agreement or you're, at least you're on the main direction in which uh, this holy man is, is, is expressing uh, the movement of the spirit. So the spirit also is, is very evident in the desire or need of many people around the world to, for a deeper meaning in life and a closer union with God. And, and this is what you're contributing to, primarily in being faithful and regular to the inner room and to praying in secret. The reason Jesus says to pray in secret is interesting. It's because your Father, who is in secret, will reward you. So if God is a secret, that's the only place you'll find him by becoming secret too, especially secret to yourself during the prayer, which really means, not that you'll forget yourself utterly, but that your investment in your own self-interest begins to go down, leaving you free to be and to do whatever God calls you to do. Bottom line, of course, remains, love is all.